Um, and we'll explain what Ferrari watches and everything involved as we go along. And in um, the um, steady decline in amphibians. We have seen a steep decline in our amphibian pro uh, populations worldwide. Um, approximately 30% are threatened with extinction worldwide. Um, over 40% are showing significant declines. Um, and during that um, because because history, um, there was also for over 90 species being declared into the wild, and this is worldwide. Um, it is water as likely spread by direct contact. So our different habitat our frogs and toads will live in. Um, one is our swamp or woodland swamp. Our swamps are areas where the land permanently saturated or filled with water. That's because it says it doesn't necessarily mean you can have a lot of visible water in the drier time. You may not have water overfill in vernal pools. My favorite is the vernal pool. This is a very unique habitat. Um, vernal pools, when I in its most simplest form, is a gigantic. So you're going to have this area that has no permanent inlet or et, and it's the filling is of rain we've been having, any snow as that melts, all of that is going to run off and, and fill these vernal pools. They start to fill up and sometimes you'll see them starting to fill now um, or even earlier in the winter, depending on where you are and what the temperatures are on um, what the precipitation is. Um, and then those, as the summer starts, is the surrounding temperature going to the vernals, um, our salamanders, spotted salamanders, Jefferson salamanders. And we have indicator species of pools for um, frogs, for frogs as well, our wood frogs, um, our wood frogs and our newly found uh, Eastern spadefoot, which we'll talk about in a few. Um, they actually are very cold tolerant and will move around and move over ice, over snow, if those vernal poles and lichens are right um, to go for, for breeding. Wet meadows, they often look like your typical meadow of fields but they are a type of marsh and they do have a very, very saturated soil. And oftentimes, um, if you have any high rain, those are gonna be those meadows where if you walk in them, they're gonna have water on top of the, the soil. And that soil will remain saturated throughout the year. So 20 acres. They do not dry up in the summer, almost always can and very little emergent vegetation um, in, the, in the middle ponds. Hopefully there's vegetations on the sides of the ponds as well. So those are our main ones. We're going to have, and, and you can actually look at some of your other wet areas, lakes, monitoring, monitoring these calls. So our local frogs and toads, a lot of times I'm asked what the difference between frogs and toads are. And if you look at a frog and you look at a toad, um, frogs have oftentimes, they both have stubby front legs, but frogs will have a more slender body. Um, they, they tend to be made for jumping. The toads will have chunkier bodies. Um, so they're, my husband says he's built for comfort, not speed. So the toads are going to have by a jelly. So you don't know if you walk up to like a vernal pool and you see a bunch of egg masses and they look big globs of softballs. 
wood frog egg masses. But if you see eggs that are laid in a strand, then you would stop ogling, you know it's one of our toads. So our local species, we actually only have two, two, two true toads in our area. Um, that's the American toad and the Fowler's toad. You'll see way down, I put Eastern eight foot toad with a couple of little dots there. And I'll talk about that in a second. Our frogs are, our most typical are gonna be our spring cricket, upland chorus, green. What are our most identifiable ones? Yet one that most people have not actually seen in person is our spring peeper. Our spring peeper is a very small, um, if it gets to be an inch and a half in length, that is a well full grown adult. Um, usually it's about the size of my pinky tip. Um, they are known for having X on their back. Um, you can see here, there's this, this X mark on the back. They're native to Central Eastern United States. Um, they actually are a type of tree frog. Um, they spend their time in the tree about three feet high and down. So they're going to be ones to find towards the ground, on the ground, and at the lower part of the trees. Um, they have very distinct auditory um, sound, and it's uh, an indicator for spring for a lot of us. Um, they will breed in the spring heavily, but then also if we have warmth in the fall, they can have a second calling season in the fall as well. Um, they are an early early um, visitor to our vernal pools, to our ponds, um, and as such, they are one of the first that are gonna develop into froglets and leave the water. So this is what they are going to sound like. So we're going to get some samples of what our local frogs and toads sounds like. And this is our spring peeper. Spring peeper, Sudacris crucifer. So as you can see, spring peepers have a very familiar call. However, what a lot of people don't realize is they have beginnings to that chorus, and they'll have a trill going into and out of the main chorus. Um, so sometimes if you've got a large population of spring peepers and you hear some of those different sounds, and long enough, you'll hear them oftentimes going into that full chorus. Um, like I said, they're, they're one of fantastic um, where if I want to do my nocturnal amphibian box, um, people learn here. You got green. Sometimes the band is a little thicker here and the Y is not as formed as you see here, but they're always going to have this green mossy colored look going down the back. Um, they tend to not crease, but they rather will stay on in or near permanent bodies of water. So these are ones that you're going to most likely find in your pond areas. Um, areas where you're going to have water throughout the year. And these guys actually 
are diurnal in nature, which means that they are active during the day. And these little guys that are about an inch in length can jump over three feet. So a lot of these small little frogs will surprise you at how far they can jump in those back hind legs. You can see those really long legs um, equip them to be able to jump. So this is our cricket frog and you'll be able to tell And this is why and where um, it's referred to both East and Northern cricket frog um, because we tend to split um, and rename um, based on more information that we get. Um, th these guys, we have seen some. They're not as common as small one as our peepers, but we are we we do see them. Upland chorus frog is another one of our small frogs. They're about an inch in length. Um, they're going to have color on to gray to reddish brown, and they have stripes that go along the sides of the body on each side. You can see that darker stripe, and it's going to be on the other side as well. Um, and their lip here is going to be white. Um, so if you see them, and you're not, if it's a peeper or not, the easiest way is not to try to figure out whether or not um, this is an upland chorus frog right away, but you can tell easily the difference between these guys and a peeper because the peeper has the X. And these guys also can get quite the chorus going, hence the reason that they are called frogs. They are a variety of, of our chorus frogs. Green frogs. Green frogs are one of the more opportunistic frog species they have here. If you put a pond in your backyard, if, you, um, if it's a male or female, this tympanum right here, this ear cover, um, if it it's going to be approximately twice the diameter of their eye. It's a female, that tympan will be the same size as the eye. So you can see on the side here that this is obviously much larger than the eye. So this is actually a male adult um, green frog. These guys can be huge rain colors. Um, we call them green frogs, but a lot of A string or a, a rubber band that you're plucking that's tight. Green frog. Lithobates clamatans, formerly Rana clamatans. distinctive call in general, but there's a lot of other um, small local issues that I'll make. American bullfrog. Um, American bullfrog people often get American bullfrogs and green frog mixed. Um, American bullfrogs. This is a female. You can see that the tympanum right there is the same diameter as the eye, um, whereas and this guy is much larger. Again, green and bullfrogs both have that characteristic. Um, bullfrogs are our largest frog in North America. They can grow over eight inches in length. Um, they are found in freshwater lakes, ponds, marshes. 
marshes and that they are just area. People think that American bullfrogs, because they hear about them being invasive, um, are not native to this area. They actually are native to the Eastern United States. They are introduced in the Western United States. And there are several areas in the Western United States where they have become um, quite an invasive species and has been, have been wreaking havoc on a lot of the local populations um, because they are, are very gregarious for eating. If its mouth is quite large, they will eat it from fish to lizard snakes to other folks to birds um, to rodents. So if it fits, they will they will they will eat it. Um, females again are slightly and here is our American bullfrog. American bullfrog. Lithomaceanus, formerly Rana Catesbiana. <laughs> Is our big American bullfrog. One of my favorites is a pickerel frog. Um, pickerel frogs are where near water and in the moist wetlands, the damp wetland areas. Um, these are the guys that I find a lot of times uh, around my pond. I have rock work, and if I move a rock, they're going to be in that that damp, dark area. Um, they're not a huge, but they're they're bigger than chorus frogs we've seen so far, but not as big as our green frogs. They get to be about an inch and a half to three inches in length. Um, they will lay a few thousand eggs um, that will attach to vegetation again. Now, these guys are often confused with these guys, which are our coastal prains, leopard frog, aka our, our leopard frog or southern leopard frog. Um, it's um, it's a fun time to be in herpetology because the names are always being split and divided. Um, as you can see, both of these guys um, have markings on their backs, on their sides, um, but there are some distinct differences. One of the main distinct differences of these guys, if you look at them from the top, is you can see these blotches that go down the back um, and they are in rows. So they are gonna be either two or three rows, and these are gonna be more rectangular blotches and they're gonna be very even pattern going down either side. Um, this one, in this case has one set on one side and one set on the other. Um, and if you look for that, you're gonna be able to, to notice it right away. As opposed to this guy, they're gonna have splotches, but they're not as defined. Some of them are circles, some of them are rhombuses, some of them look like arcane and Oklahoma, different splotches that are So those are kind of like the old men of the uh, of the frogs. Um, they just sound creaky, um, and that's our pickerel, pickerel frogs. So this is our coastal plains leopard frog. Um, they are just a little bit bigger, oftentimes, than our pearl frogs, about two to three and a half inches in length. Um, they are brown, brown to green in color. Frog watch, you're going to be doing things at night, so. You, 
you're not going to see sometimes as much as you hear, um, depending on the situation. Some of these are, are a lot shorter. Uh, pickerel frogs and leopard frogs are notorious shy. So if they hear a lot of disruption, they will stop calling. Um, so it can be hard to see them. Um, these guys live in areas with slower moving water that have a lot of vegetation. Um, they can inhabit open meadows that are further away from the water source during the summer. Um, they can lay up to about 5,000 eggs in those warmer, shallow waters. These guys uh, do hibernate in the... And this is one that will often confuse people the most because, if, as you can see, they have quite the cornucopia of different sounds for calls that they will make. Wood frogs. These are one of our first ones that we see um, out in the um, sometimes the midwinter, late winter to early spring. Um, they are probably the most gregarious birds. Um, they will be calling the day and they will be calling at night. They will have this map that uh, goes from the tip of their nose past their eye and down to the terminus of their cheek on both sides. So you can see it's even on this one. And when they are darker, it is harder to detect that. Um, but that mask is always there um, on any of our wood frogs. So these guys um, are one of our um, vernal pole indicator species, um, meaning that they do rely on those temporary pools that have no fish for their breeding. Um, they will take shelter in the leaf litter during the winter. Um, as well. These are the only species of frog that lives um, north in the Arctic Circle, and they actually produce a special biological antifreeze that allows them to actually freeze solid um, if the conditions are freezing outside, and then they will actually be able to, um, and, and that antifreeze will decrease the amount of ice crystals that are forming in the, in the blood, and it will allow them to actually freeze solid and thaw back out once the temperatures become um, more conducive for their activity. Um, these guys lay these giant masses um, that look like softballs and they're each individual eggs that look like about marble size that are all um, stuck together and it forms this one large ball um, that's about the size of a softball. And they will lay eggs in these communities and you can have hundreds of these masses at any given area. So this is our um, wood frog. Wood frog, Lithobates sylvaticus, formerly Rana sylvatica. And it's obviously a, a lower pitch call than something like a, a string peeper, but um, if you're walking along in the woods and you are around any kind of vernal pools, any kind of um, seasonal, seasonal type of wetland, um, they are very loud um, when they are when they are breeding in, in greater numbers. So we have two. We have several other tree frogs. So like I said, there's spring peeper and a couple of other frogs, but two that are labeled a tree frog. One is the gray tree frog, and the other is the Cope's gray tree frog. As you can see, they look identical, um, and they are. Um, visually, they are identical. Um, it's genetically that you can tell differences, and their calls that you can tell differences. Um, species. So they, it, same with the peepers, if they have water, then they will breed in that 
in that water source. Um, they lay about that to two thousand eggs in shallow bodies of water, um, and these can be tire ruts. Um, I spend I don't know a week or two. Left Uh, they will find it, and um, they are very, very loud. If anyone has a pond near their house, um, they're full in, in breed. Guys can be quite, quite a loud um, chorus as well. So here is our gray tree frog. They have a longer call. Um, you'll see the difference in the copes um, just a second here. So that is our gray tree frog. And here is our co gray tree frog. Um, very much everything the same as gray tree frog here, except for a couple of things. You can see that these guys will lay quite a few. These guys lay up to 2,000 eggs. They're going to be grouped in smaller groups um, or so. Then the great tree first groups will have them in some groups. Um, but in <laughs> so you can see there is a very distinctive um, difference between those two calls, and that's how you're going to be able to differentiate between the Great tree frog and the copes great tree frog. And a lot of times um, our copes in this area tend to be more east, like in Fairfax County, I know that they see more copes great tree frogs than great tree frogs. <laughs> to um, experience an explosive breeding event that these guys have every single year. Um, we're fortunate to find the only breeding events that are recorded in Loudoun County. And this one here that you're seeing, this, this picture is the first um, foot individual that has been found in over 10 years in Loudoun County. And that occurred this past year in 22. Um, these breeding events are short-lived and can involve in the cases of what we experience stories, especially when you start to get down past Richmond and down to Virginia Beach area, um, they tend to be more common. Same with uh, Maryland. When you start to get Eastern, they start to become more, more common. The, um, these here defied everything that people knew. I presented at a conference about these guys and the two takeaways that people were really surprised at were the substrate in which they're living, which is not in any way sandy. It's actually um, in
turbicle right there um, that they use to dig There's one on each of their hind feet. Um, and you can see just different, this is their egg masses around in one of our holes. This is them hatching. And actually when they hatch, they will rest on vegetation. Um, and all of them had this characteristic of resting. Um, and everything again was also dependent upon temperature. Um, in warmer temperatures caused faster development. Um, and, um, but they would rest for sometimes hours um, prior to actually getting up and moving around. So you can see these guys resting on the vegetation. Um, they do have a very um, trans transparent um, underside. So you can see intestine, you can see lung development, heart, that's their mouth. Um, so that's a characteristic of these guys. And that's one that had just left the water and right before. So you can see we were able to capture um, quite a bit of uh, information um, about these guys that were actually still compiling all of the information. So our town um, that, that doesn't drain anything anymore, he literally sits there and waits for bugs to come him. And see, he's gotten a little chunky in the process, um, but he's, he's been around for a while. So we have two. Run out of breath. How long are we? American toad. An Xerus Americanus. Formerly Bufo Americanus. These guys live in woodlands and meadows. Um, they are a ground burrower um, during hibernation. And again, they will lay in strands of upwards of 20,000 eggs in their strands. Um, and they are one who respond to heavy rainfall. Is, um, they want water that has a shadow, um, shallow black currents. Um, and again, this is another one that will excrete a toxin that can be distasteful to predators. So this is our Fowler's toad. Fowler's Fowleri, formerly Bufo Fowleri. Later than usual. Um, so our frogs make an appearance um, at our burrows because there was no water. Um, and one bad season, two bad seasons, a couple of bad seasons aren't hurt the population. Um, most of the time, they'll just reabsorb those eggs, go back to what they're doing, um, and wait for the next year. When you start to get maybe three or four or five seasons, you're really starting to make a potential impact because because of the um, the breeding age range for these guys as well. Um, so you can see uh, these um, coastal frogs, um, chorus frogs, pickerels um, can start early. Um, and again, it depends conditions. Um, a lot of our frogs, except for peepers and wood frogs, tend to like to do just a little bit warmer. So we've got a warm spell in these early months, you are gonna see more frogs that are gonna be coming out. And so potentially can be taken Taking advantage of protocols for monitoring in this dog. Um, I actually found the guy on the way to check for vernal pools last year. He's in a he's in a bog that's close to my my house that I monitor um, for Frog Watch as well. Um, so Frog Watch, the amphibian history. So um, here I get 
we purchased in some amphibian surveys um, a week ago. Um, we had a, a kind of a hiatus here at Loudoun Wildlife for maybe good six to eight years. Um, this program originally survey, um, and it was a um, monitoring program. We we'll were watch at the time. Um, and all of the information, all of that data um, is still with the frog monitoring that has been going on since 1998. Um, now consistent of and so you would drive to those different sites um, once a week um, or once every two weeks, depending on particular protocol, um, to see what those, those particular um, wetland areas were doing as far as, as um, frog and, uh, and toad calls. Um, that actually became quite cumbersome um, and it actually made it so it was hard for people to have consistent um, participation. So it was actually very, very different. Um, the Frog Watch program does this as a site-specific um, program. So if you have a backyard pond, you can register your backyard pond. Um, if you have, we have several people who do um, their HOA, HOAs have ponds and oftentimes they'll have, you know, their ponds, retention ponds, streams, any of those wet areas, um, and they will monitor those in their HOA. Um, or maybe you have vernal pools down the road or a stream that runs behind your house. Any of those wet areas, and you can do multiples. If you wanna do five or if you only wanna do one, that's perfectly fine. Um, so all the information will come to me and I will enter that data into um, the Frog Watch. Um, and so here you can see, we're gonna do a location of the site, the person who's gonna be monitoring the site, area that the site is located, um, and the type of habitat. Is it a pond or is it a vernal pool? Um, and here's a, a picture of this. I'm gonna be sending this to everybody but it's just kind of a screenshot as to what this is going to be looking at. Um, and this needs to be filled out completely um, so that I can fill it out um, in conjunction with um, the AZA um, requirements. Latitude and longitude are, are very important um, so that we know where that, where that body of water is. So it'll have your information, um, the site name, um, like, we have a pond in our backyard and we call it Erickson Pond. Um, that way we know exactly what it is, um, what, what type it is, what type, and some things you don't know. Like if you don't know what the water source is, um, where it gets its water from, that's perfectly fine, just say not known. Um, you don't have to fill out all that information if you don't know if it is fed from a spring or if it's fed from runoff, you, you, you don't have to fill that out if you're, if you're not sure. Um, so our monitoring steps, and if you and if you don't, and we'll go over the two, but if you don't have a site that you have in mind, reach out and I can help you find um, something, um, I can help you find a site um, to, uh, to monitor. So our monitoring steps, this actually is not time, time, uh, it doesn't take a lot of time. Sorry, I was a little flub there. Um, Basically, there are some specific times to go out, um, but the total time you're there at your site could be 10 minutes from the time you get to the site to the time you're back in your car. Um, so they need to be a minimum of 30 minutes after sunset. And if anyone goes out after dark, that's when the amphibians come to life. Um, there's kind of the joke that bird people our morning people and amphibian and bat people most of the time are night owls. I have no problem being out at two o'clock in the morning with amphibians, but it's really hard to get me up at the crack of dawn um, to go see some, some birds, even though I really like birds and everything. It's just, I tend to be more of that night owl. So this works really well for, for a lot of the night owls. Um, so at least a half an hour um, after sunset and should conclude prior to 1 a.m. Any time during that period is perfectly fine, whatever works for you. Um, the reason they say it should conclude prior to 1 a.m. Is, is most of our frogs and toads that are in this area, some are different depending on where you are in the world. Some are 
are active and calling both at dawn and dusk, um, but ours here for the most part, um, apart from some exceptions are during the um, sunset hours. And after about that 1 a.m., they start to, to dissipate. So to get that strongest call, um, which is gonna give us an idea of the strength of population, um, it, it needs to be during those time periods. You wanna consider the temperature, precipitation, and wind conditions before you visit. If it's too cold, um, there may not be any activity at all. If it's too windy, they may not be calling because again, they're calling for, to be able to um, attract uh, breeding and, and the quality of their call um, is going to oftentimes attract that, that female. And um, if, the, if it's windy, that's not gonna be heard. And also it's gonna kind of damper your ability to hear as well. Um, if you're at a site, um, especially one that you maybe visit, like, like say you have an HOA pond and notice, note any changes. So maybe they are doing some erosion control around that retention pond um, and put down you know, some, some of the netting and straws and stuff. That's the kind of thing that can actually disrupt a population. So if you see any, any kind of changes, just put those down and note that. We've actually said we had some of them and they're very active amphibian habitat that um, they're monitoring. Uh, we've had this happen several times, um, was bulldozed for housing development. Um, so we made sure that we made notes of that as well in the data that we're sending, um, that I send off to the, um, the national um, database so that they know that some of these sites are in fact actually being lost. Um, and we wouldn't really have as much information about the impact of that if we weren't monitoring these sites. Um, record all your weather information, including the temperature, wind speed, um, current precipitation, and the weather history. Um, did it, has it rained in the past 24 hours? Um, is it currently raining? Um, what is your air temperature? Uh, most people can find that on your phone or can find that in your car. Um, and remember, and it's one of those that probably doesn't need to be said, but it does, is to be respectful of the area you're in and minimize any, any disturbances. Um, if they stop calling, it means that something has disturbed them. Um, if you are at the car, or if you're at the car and you get, this happens to me all the time, I have a very messy car. If you get out and a piece of paper falls out of your car, pick the paper up and put it back in. You'd be amazed at how many people actually don't do that. So um, we want to make sure that we're leaving things even better possible than when we were there. Um, so the steps to monitoring, you're, when you get to your site, and my site, one of my sites here is my back, is my pond back there, so my husband monitors that, he just goes outside and sits for two minutes with a beer and waits, um, so you want to remain quiet for two minutes, so when you arrive to your site, you want to remain quiet for two minutes, um, what happens is if you approach an area where there's a lot of calling occurring, your approach can disturb um, those frogs and toads and being quiet and still for two minutes can actually help them acclimate and they um, will continue um, with their calling. When you're ready, you wanna cup your, hair, your, your hands around your ears. Um, again, that's a, a very easy thing to do to be able to direct the, um, the uh, sound to come into your ears and you wanna listen for exactly three minutes. And you're going to remain quiet during that three minutes um, of data collection. Um, for, and you're going to listen for those frogs and toads. Um, and they may stop calling if you start to make any kind of noise. So you want to be very, very quiet. Um, after those three minutes, you want to record the time you started listening, the time you stopped, the species you heard, and the call intensity um, for each of those species. What I often will do um, is I will record their calls. Um, I, um, I will bring my phone. I actually have a voice recorder as well. Um, and that works well because it doesn't have a lot of lights. It's just one of those little cheapy old ones that you used to use in college classes so that you could uh, record the teacher so you could sleep in class. Not that I ever did that. Um, so when you, um, when you get there, I often will have like a t-shirt or my shirt that I can put um, underneath so that the light doesn't bother 
um, bother any of the amphibians. And I will actually record the calls during the during that time period because sometimes I might miss something. Um, when you and people who have have done this um, in the past, you could get a full chorus of spring peepers plus a full chorus of frogs and wood frogs and tree frogs, and you may not be listening, be able to decipher all of those specific species at that time. But if you um, record them, not only are you going to be able to go back and replay it and be able to go, oh, wait, right, I do hear some green frogs in there. But it's also, you can play it back and it's going to help you get better and better at, um, at learning our different frog and toad calls. Um, and any additional information can be documented in the notes section. And this is a very important thing. If there's, if you're listening to it and it's interrupted by any loud noise or disturbance, restart minute acclimation period and then the three minute data collection. And then remember to change that time on the, on the sheet as well. Um, this can happen a lot of times where um, if you have anything that's like near the road and you get maybe a loud truck that goes by, that can actually cause disturbance um, for those frogs and toads that are calling. Um, so you'll just need to restart that over. But you can see clearly that that monitoring is five minutes. So two minutes of quiet and five of listening. Um, and then it'll take you some time to be able to, to get that data collection sheet um, filled out, but um, it's, it's not as labor intensive as the old method and it allows for a lot more people to participate. So the call intensity um, is zero means no frogs or toads are heard calling. So you go to what you go to your backyard pond and you sit there and you hear nothing. Um, one is where you can hear individuals. So it's not that intense, but there is some calling and you can, you can almost say, oh, well, I've got five individuals here. So that's a number one. And two is where you can still hear those calls of individuals. They can be distinguished, but you're gonna have some overlapping calls. Number three is the full chorus, the calls are constant, they're overlapping, they're continuous. And if you're talking about birds, they can actually hurt your ears. Um, some people actually will bring earplugs with them because um, the call of those peepers can be really, really loud. If you're unsure or believe you have a frog or toad that has not been previously confirmed in your area, try to record the call and then um, I, can, I can help you identify that. Um, especially, I'm gonna note that I always say, Anybody who finds the spade foot is going to get the prize. Well, we found spade foots, but we also are wanting to, to see where else they are. So this whole spade foots is, like I said, is, is exploding into more, more questions that need to be answered um, as far as their population numbers and their behaviors as well. So spade foots is one to just kind of keep in the back of your mind. If you hear something that sounds a little bit different, um, you might have one of those. Okay, frequency of the survey sites. Um, you can do, again, one site or you can do multiple sites. I do my backyard ponds, I do a bog nearby, and I do all of the vernal pools at the JK Black Oak. Um, so you can do multiple um, survey sites um, depending on your availability. And that's the beauty of this is that um, if you have a backyard pond and you've got 10 minutes every two weeks and you say, hey, I can monitor this, that's fantastic because that's a population that is unknown to us. And knowing um, that you have that kind of activity in a backyard pond um, gives us information about their population. Um, and remember that that consistent data will help with this long-term tracking of the populations. Um, it's recommended that you go at a minimum of every two weeks. Um, some people will go once a week. Two weeks is I, perfectly fine as well, because again, we're looking at those calls and a lot of times you get overlapping of one call that they're starting to, to fade out or another species is starting to pick up. Um, that way you have less of a chance of missing any of those calls. Um, if two weeks is not feasible, then at least once during the peak one per peak period. And our peak periods 
um, they have these runs and these runs are, are kind of their, their time period. Um, but these are very, very different depending on where you are. Um, like this one here, June 15th through July 15th, we go further um, just because of our weather and precipitation. We tend to go further and sometimes even into September. Um, but the February 15th to March 15th, they call that run one. Um, and so if you can get one during this period of time, then at least we've got that information. But if you can go every two weeks, that's fantastic. Every week, that's fine. I won't complain about having to put in more data. It's, it's perfectly okay. Um, and there's, this is an important one, is there's no minimum temperature set. So some species will, um, will only come out and breed if there's a certain minimum temperatures above a certain degrees. Um, but our early spring, late, late winters, um, like our spring peepers, our wood frogs, those guys will come out when it is 30 degrees outside. Um, oftentimes 35 tends to be a, a number um, that's fairly reasonable because it's not freezing. Um, it's not, it's not, it's above freezing. So that tends to be kind of an, a an area where we, we tend to see the activity starting up in conjunction with the rain, um, rainy weather. So this run new, which is what they call the spring. Um, if you could do just one during that period of time, that's okay. Um, again, it's, it's more information than we had before. Um, if you can do it more often, then that's perfectly fine. If you can do it once every two weeks or once a week, then that's perfectly wonderful. Um, and the spring, a minimum of over about 42 degrees. Um, that way, these spring collars that don't come out when it's cold um, will start to be coming out. So that minimum temperature, and that's the temperature when you're going out. It's not the temperature that it was during the day when the sun was out. Um, so if it was... 55 degrees during the day, but it's going to be 32 degrees at night, it's still going to be a little chilly um, to be able to, to get these spring guys, but you still will be getting these guys that, that don't seem to worry about how cold it is. Late spring, you're going to start to see these guys oftentimes if your minimum temperature is about 55 degrees, um, and these early summer guys, minimum temperature about 65 degrees, um, and these are the ones on that chart you see that breed kind of later um, so, and again, ours will run into September, oftentimes, if the conditions are right. Wind. So the wind is measured based on what's called the Buford Wind Scale, and it was developed um, by the British Navy to describe the effects of wind at sea. Um, so on the data sheet, which you'll also get emailed, um, will be this chart right here to be able to identify what the wind is. So it's, and if you had a candle that smoke would rise vertically, there's no movement in the air. It's, it's really quite calm. A light air, um, your weather vanes would still be inactive. Um, you're going to get a little bit of drifting of smoke, um, start to get some leaves rustling. You can feel a little bit of breeze on your face. Um, a gentle breeze, you get leaves and twigs that are more of a constant motion, and your smaller flags will extend. Those are the only times when you should be monitoring for frogs um, and toads. These two moderate, um, when small branches are moving, dust and loose paper, you know, those days, if you have papers, they will fly off the table. Um, and these fresh breeze where the small trees and the leaves will begin to sway. These are too windy to monitor. Again, they're not going to call as much, and that sound of them, of the ones that do call, are going to be dampered um, by that wind. So you're not going to get as full a picture. So it's perfectly fine to say, you know what, I'm going to monitor on Friday nights. And if the conditions aren't right, wait a few days or wait the next day, um, or go a day early if you see that the conditions are going to be better the day before. Um, when to monitor based on weather. Um, there may be an important relationship between the species you hear calling and the weather conditions. Um, there are times when weather conditions are appropriate, inappropriate for data collection. So monitor again, we want that air temperature to be over 35 degrees. 
Um, you don't want it to be raining too hard. Now, here's the caveat with that. There are a couple of species that won't come out unless it's raining exceptionally hard. Um, and that is the Fowler's toad likes heavier rain. They tend to be a later in the season breeder, mid to late season. And the spadefoots. If we did not go out, we were actually, we have a herpetology um, team that goes out and we do surveys um, in different, in a couple of different areas. Um, but if we weren't out doing that in the rain, I mean, as well, we would not have found um, those first um, spadefoots because it was a heavy rain event that started to bring them out. Um, so if you say, you know what, I think that this temporary pool in the middle of April to the beginning of May might be a good location for spadefoots, then, you know, wait till it's maybe above 40, 45 degrees, and then go out when it's raining at a heavier, steadier rain. That's going to be when you're potentially going to be able to hear the spadefoots. If you hear what you think are spadefoots, please record them. Please record and send me that so that we can um, verify it. Um, and so I can add that to a potential site where we're finding these spadefoots. Um, and you don't want the wind to be stronger than a gentle breeze, which is a three on that um, Beaufort wind scale. Um, what to bring to the survey site. There is nothing worse than getting to a survey site and realize you have not brought anything. Um, your data collection sheets, um, and you can do that in a variety of different ways. You know, you can write down notes, you can write it right on the sheets. Um, pencils or pens, because something to write with is always handy. Um, a clipboard or something else hard to write on, because remember, these guys like it was damp. So writing on damp paper is never easy or fun. So having a surface often I will put paper in there so it doesn't get wet. Slide or headlamp. Um, I have both. Um, I have, and it's one of my favorites. It's a Dremel flashlight. It's rechargeable. I got it at Home Depot. And I really like that flashlight for um, different spot light stuff. Um, if I need to look at something and not want to blind anybody, or if I need to look a little bit further out than the headlamp goes. Um, otherwise, I just have headlamps that are rechargeable um, that do a, a white light, um, a green light, and a red light. Um, and I like to have those, those different options as well. Um, a watch or timer, um, most people have that on their phone so that you can time when you're gonna be out there. Um, ability to know your out, outdoor temperature. Um, so if you have it on your phone or if you have it on your car, um, it doesn't have to be exact. Um, so sometimes those, the ones on the cars can fluctuate a couple of degrees, but if it's in that range that we talked about, then, then that's gonna be perfectly fine. A cell phone. Um, you're going to be out at night, um, so you want to have a cell phone. You want to have a way to be able to, to talk to somebody and let them know. Um, rain gear, reflective gear, um, reflective if you're going to be near the road. I live in frog togs, and, um, and they make a great waiter, too, for, for anyone who wants to participate in any of the herp stuff we do. Um, but I live in those frog togs because you can just fold them up and put them in your car. Um, and the ability to record. The ability to record is, is such a wonderful thing. Um, I actually go back and listen to the recordings of things that I did last year um, as well, just as a reference. Um, so it's nice to be able to have those recordings. And this is what your data sheet is gonna look like. Again, I will send this out to everybody, um, but it's, um, oh, it's the survey site registration again. I don't know why I did that. Um, the data sheet is gonna, have, is gonna look very much like this. I'm not sure why I did this twice. Um, I love Microsoft PowerPoint, or maybe I just don't, it doesn't love me enough. So it's going to look like this, but it's going to have the site information, it's going to have the wind, it's going to have um, the precipitation, the history, what the temperature was the past 24 hours, if it was above freezing, if there was any precipitation the past 24 hours um, prior to you being there, because that will make a difference. If it has been dry as anything, um, a lot of times your activity can be different than if you've had three or four days of rain in a row, um, what your wind is like, and then the species that you hear, um, and you write in those species on the sheet and you just check, you know, zero to zero to four, um, zero to three, whether or not it's a, 
no calls or full chorus. Um, this is something that you will experience. Um, you're going to be out, um, monitoring any site, even if you're monitoring a site in your neighborhood. Um, amphibians on the roads. The more roads we make, the more they transect both amphibian and reptile habitat. Um, Uh, a vehicle. So during these breeding times, it can be very just fairly common to encounter these amphibians on a road. Um, so you want to be able to help them if it's safe for you to do so. Um, the important thing is, is that they're going to be headed from point A to point B. And most of the time, a lot of times people will have good intentions and they will see like a box turtle. Box turtles are notorious for that. Um, people will see a box turtle crossing the road, going from what they what they perceive of a point A to point B. The box turtle is like, I'm going from here to here. And the person picking it up will see that it's only made it a third of the way across the road and will put it back on the road, side of the road that it just came from. Well, guess what that box turtle is going to do, or that spotted salamander, or that wood frog? Those guys are going to go back again over that road. Um, so it's very, very important that if you do help an amphibian across the road, that you put it on the other side of the road in the direction it was originally headed, because it knows where it was going. You don't know where it was going. Um, you're just helping it get across the road so it doesn't get hit. Handling of amphibians is highly discouraged, um, except when you're moving them off the road. I, um, you'll see that I'll handle um, amphibians to be able to look at their um, vents, to be able to get a measurement on them. Um, but I also never put lotion on my hands. Um, yes, I, I get bit up by mosquitoes because I don't put um, any kind of bug spray on me. Um, even some that can go on the uh, on your clothes can be aquatic toxic. So, um, so my hands are are clean of any of those. Um, but what I do do as well is I will keep my hands wet when I'm moving a lot of our amphibians. Um, I will use um, you can use a puddle water if there's a puddle right there. You can use your bottle of water um, just to get a little dampness on your hands. Um, and then you want to just scoop them up gently with your hands cupped so that you don't um, injure the amphibian and just move them across um, across the road and and drop them off on the other side of the road. Not one inch, usually probably about a foot to two feet in is good, um, but you want to make sure that they're headed in the same direction. Safety precautions. Um, Safety is important, the safety is most important. If you feel uncomfortable by the surroundings, stop monitoring and leave the site and let me know. Um, some of the precautions can include having a first aid kit. Um, my first aid kit consists of some band-aids, a bottle of water, and maybe an old t-shirt, um, but it at least has something that if I need to um, find my car, um, I just that have fallen over. So you, you can get an idea of what that terrain looks like. But also, you know, if you're monitoring spurnal pools at a, at a specific site, um, you can potentially see the um, results of your monitoring. You might be able to see egg masses in the water. Um, or in the case of wood frogs, you might actually see wood frogs actively um, calling and breeding during the day as well. Um, don't monitor if the water, if the weather is severe um, or inappropriate weather is predicted. Um, I like to tell people I go to Black Oak all the time, and Black Oak is notorious for having a tree fall down here or there. And I was there at like 11 o'clock at night, and I always bring somebody with me, um, so I'm not there by myself. Um, but we had just finished at one pool, one of the vernal pools, and we're walking to another one, and a giant tree fell. It hit the ground right where we were walking or where we were at that last pool. Um, it was just a little too windy to be there at Black Oak that night. 
Um, and that's kind of when it was real. I realized that that trees like to fall there. So if it's if it's at all windy, um, we will forego going to Black Oak until the conditions are better. Um, and again, monitor with a partner or let somebody know um, where you are and when you intend to return. If you are doing this monitoring and you say, hey, I'm going to bring my husband with me, that's perfectly fine. If your Boy Scout is doing this monitoring, make sure he has a parent that comes with them um, for safety purposes. Be aware of poison ivy and other things such as ticks, hornets, all that kind of fun stuff um, because they just, they like me a lot. Um, so maybe they like some of you too. Um, locating appropriate hats for frogs and monitoring. Um, the survey site, site me wetland area, doesn't matter what the size is. Again, I have three small artificial ponds in my backyard and they have a ton of activity throughout the, the frog breeding season. You wanna make sure that it's easy and accessible um, and safe. And so you don't wanna have to be jumping over fences um, to be able to get to, to the site. A lot of people will ask, you know, how close do you need to be to that site? Um, and that depends on the site. Um, you'd be amazed at how much trees and terrain will block the sounds. Um, so if I have, if I'm monitoring six active vernal pools at JK Black Oak, that's because the terrain is such that I have six very different um, pools that have, that you can hear and can't hear depending on where you are on the property. Um, if the survey site's not on your property, make sure you get permission um, from the landowner. Um, and sometimes our, our parks are actually open to, um, to having some monitoring, but we just need to get permission um, to make sure that, because it would be after hours at night. Um, so we'd have to get permission from them. So if there's any kind of park near you that you wanted to be able to do that, that somebody else may not already be monitoring, um, I can help you set that up. Um, and again, if you don't have a specific location, we can help you locate an appropriate site based on your needs, like location. You might not want to drive 45 minutes to, to do a five minute survey. Um, important, important, important. Record your hours with loud and wildlife. Um, it's important to record, remember to record the, the hours with Loud Wildlife Conservancy. And yes, you can still record your time for hours if you're a Virginia Master Naturalist and you need those hours. You can record them for both. Um, and I've made sure that you can record them for both. Um, the, the scouts as well, I know that I had several scout groups reach out to me and they need to have fulfill hours, um, but also, we need to remember to um, log those hours with Loudon Wildlife Conservancy. And when you do that, you want to go to loudonwildlife.org and select volunteer hours in the drop down menu under the volunteer heading. And you're going to be prompted to record your hours. You're going to select amphibian monitoring program under the activities and um, then fill in the information accordingly. So here you can see I've got a screenshot. This is the main home page. Um, volunteer, I've, I've kind of hovered a volunteer um, tab and this drop down menu, you'll see volunteer hours here. And then when you click on it, it'll bring you to the screen. So you're gonna do, and you can record up to three events at a time. Um, so you can do, it'll ask you if like, if you did a month's worth and you wanna do, um, do each of those at, at um, one time, you can do that um, just, make sure that you're, it'll ask you at the bottom if you, if you want to um, do another, um, record another event. Um, but you can see here under activity and amphibian monitoring program. That way it goes to the right, right program. But super, super important. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you can um, let me know. Um, I can answer any questions now. This is also my email, which is jerickson at loudandwildlife.org. Um, and what I will do is for everybody who, who signed up tonight and we're here tonight, I will have those survey um, form and the data form. And all of that information will come back to me 
and I will, um, where wildlife can be, our birds tend to can call a lot and we know that they're there a lot of times, not always, but these guys, these guys work really hard most of the time to stay in. So um, we want to make sure that we're, we're trying to find where they are. Um, thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, Hopefully somebody raises their hand. Yes. Hi. Sorry. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you were, would be able to email the slides. Um, yes, I actually can. Okay, um, that would be amazing. I can do that. Also, we are, you know, we're doing a recording of this as okay. well. Okay. Um, so that will also be available. But yes, I can all these slides. Um, I just have to kind of change it. Um, change it to, um, to not be this is, I'm, I'm still getting used to this whole, um, I guess it's Microsoft live so it's actually online oh, um but i can save it to an actual file and send it to you to you guys as well okay great um, thank you so that you have that um and in the past um people have wanted the calls um a stream is okay nicola um so um it doesn't need to be a pond it can be any wetland area it can be um a pond lake stream um fertile pool marsh swamp um so yay sorry i'm reading some of the comments i'm so happy i'm so excited to see everyone's excited about it um but yes i will send those out too so expect those those might take like an extra day or so um while i get that um i get that um